All a bit late. Rob was sitting there on his own for about half an hour. I'm right. sorry. I, 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 I normally put in an alert, but I didn't get the alert because I didn't get the link. So I'm innocent. He is, actually is innocent. It's my fault. I sent it to the wrong Ed. Who, who hasn't turned up either? Hasn't no. I mean, Ed Smith. Where's Ed Smith? Ed Smith? I don't even know who Ed Smith is. Ed Who's Smith, folks. Who's Ed Smith? <laughs> uh, anyway, he was invited and he hasn't turned up. So, uh, uh, so I, I, um, I'm setting an alarm a different way. That was silly of me. Okay, cool. We're all here. We're all here. Five. No need to panic at all. No, nothing. Everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> You won't realise what we're talking about, guys. At, at uh, dead on two o'clock, Rob was the only person on the call, so it was, uh, <laughs> he was getting a bit—he was getting a bit antsy. Yeah, I used to get my underwear, Bill. <laughs> well, we like to leave things right to the last second. No, we rehearse and do very dedicatedly, and we do rehearse and, <laughs> guys, and talk about what's coming up. And uh, very so good episode this week, an unusual one, uh, another. I mean, it's probably sounding like a broken record, but quite difficult to make. <laughs> yeah, Ed, yeah, okay, you played, you played that card, love, all right? Yeah, yeah. We honestly, we honestly, I honestly thought that this, uh, in terms of the demands on the director, would be one of the easier challenges. <laughs> That's all I believe in now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, in th on paper, it looks easy. Wait till you have to actually do it. <laughs> it did, were you ever tempted? I mean, it's interesting, obviously, you've done it by, you've done the swap by dubbing the voices onto the yes. other actor. Yes. Were you ever tempted, particularly with Chris's known skills, was it a temptation to ask them to play each other? It was, to be honest, yeah. And it would have, I think, obviously, that would have been a lot easier. But um, why make it easier when you can make it a little bit more complicated? I've um, got a question there, just to interrupt, sorry, yes. from Alan Ronald, and it needs to go now. Question for Ed, was this series difficult to make? And if so, why doesn't he mention it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Was any episode a doddle to make? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, ooh, I'll come back to you on that. Actually, I think probably the easiest one to shoot, although there was difficulties with electronically, but the easiest one to shoot was Marooned, I think, because it was all, all there. All nice. That play. wasn't straightforward. Yeah. Now, listen, in my career, I, there are two kinds of directors. There are directors who say, oh, you can't do that, go back and rewrite it and throw it in the bin. And there are directors who say, yeah, fine, and don't tell you how horrible a nightmare you've given them. Jeff Posner, Ed By are the two best at that. They Thank you. We do like to do it, though, later, you know. 20 odd years later, we like to bitch about it. <laughs> here on these Sunday afternoons, guys, just imagine living with this for the last 30 years. <laughs> it's so hard, Paul. It's so hard what you do. Honestly, I don't know why you couldn't have done it yourself. So I thought it was uh, going to be fairly straightforward that the actors would just mouth each other's parts. And we discussed whether or not we'd pre record the voices and play them in live, or whether we'd actually get them to do it. Uh, you know, sort of an impersonation live and then dub the voices on afterwards. And what did we end up with, Ed? Because I honestly can't remember. We well, we, did, we decided, I mean, I think that it was, apart from anything else, it was quite a fun technical challenge to make their two voices swap over. And it was then kind of a question of when we were rehearsing it, it was to see how close each could get to the other. And to be honest with you, there was quite a few times when Chris's voice obviously was so bang on accurate you thought hmm, maybe we should go that way because they're doing all the mannerisms with their body they're acting the other yeah. role anyway it would seem absolutely to just let them do the lines it was just i, I mean I, you know i think it would have been unfair because chris had a sort of yeah. facility to be able to do that better yeah. than craig simply well, because uh, of the nature of the performer he is you know not saying craig is bad it's just it's more, it's yes he was it's more of a gulf than that yeah. um because uh, chris could do an impression the way he formed his mouth was yeah. was was right for Craig to uh, fill in, but yeah. Craig, Craig could not do a, 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 a like a, a close impersonation of uh, of Chris's accent, and yeah. so his mouth shapes are always wrong. Yeah, <laughs> interesting yeah. fact, guys, all of you. The the difference um, in regional dialects in England are actually down to six letters. Oh, everybody agrees how to pronounce the consonants. And it's all about the vowels. So I get a bus and Ed gets a bass. 
I have an aunt and he has an aunt. And that's, <laughs> that's the only difference. No, it's it's bus. Buzz is it's the S that's different from the correct pronunciation, Rob, which is, of course, bus. <laughs> you say, which is I get the buzz. No, um, we don't say buzz. We might say we might no, say. Don't say the word for a red thing that goes around London. I'm not getting involved in this. This is going to end in a fight. Go on. Of course, but yeah, of course, of course. Of see, course. you haven't yeah. doing this properly, so it's all bollocks. He's, what he's telling you now is the Chris Whitty School of Science. He'll <laughs> give you a graph in a minute that shows that fifty thousand people will be saying buzz by tomorrow morning. Yeah, yeah. Come on, it's too bright. <laughs> Where are you going? Oh, it's too bright. Ed's turning his. Got to get his lighting right for his girlfriends. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's good. Ta da! <laughs> buzz, buzz, buzz. Yeah, we thought this would be a bit of a rest for Ed in the middle of the scene. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, the, the, the other process with this was we couldn't shoot this in front of an audience because it was basically impossible to do. We did think about doing it and then change the voices later. But we then thought, well, actually, we've got to throw some resources into this post dubbing, which was pretty intense. So um, we played it to an audience and it got laughs that way. Um, and so, like, as if the whole show was pre-recorded as opposed to just part of it and then shown to an audience. And in the that. final dubbing, funnily enough, going back to what you were saying, Rob, in the actual dubbing, it was easier for Craig to dub Chris than the other way around because Chris had already sort of formed the right mouths, mouthing for, for, for Craig to copy. Um, whereas it was, I mean, Chris was great, but he, it was harder for him to hit the sink. Robert's asking that very question, Ed. So just to get it right, none of this had an audience. This was the only episode we've done, I think, where there was no audience. Yeah, yeah. And it was shown to an audience. I think that there was a place at the BBC called yeah. the um, Paris... Yes, Paris Theatre, that's right. Paris Theatre. We showed it there, yeah. And it got a reasonable bout of laughs, because the other problem was, was cutting it together with the knowledge that we, yeah. there were going to be jokes and laughs. We were used to that in pre-record anyway. When you're acting out the scenes on the floor, hmm. who spoke what? They they spoke their own lines, or they spoke each other's yeah. lines? They spoke uh, they, they spoke their own scripted lines, yeah, as and, you know, as the other character, and then they right. dubbed on top of it later. But so they just spoke that in an ordinary voice. They didn't attempt to do an impression. Oh no, no, uh, they did both try, and right. Chris was very good, okay. and Craig's was good too. But you know, obviously, Chris had the edge. Right. And so then you went back cut it all together and then they did a final like on a looping session on a movie they they actually did the final absolutely the final picture yeah. full adr on those those scenes obviously when they're playing each other mm -hmm. and then um you know trying to also when we're shooting it leave room for last where we thought they were going to come so that when the last actually did come from the audience it didn't swamp the next incoming line and put a few in where you made a mistake no never paul no, never no, no, no it never happened <laughs> All right, well, let's get it rolling then. Uh, <laughs> Tell me when, Rob. Okay, three, two, one, press. And we should have a star field and the ship. Oh, yes, there we go. There we got the ship coming in. I think I got it right this time, everybody. Maybe. Wow. Hurrah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and now the, the, this idea hadn't been uh, somebody's asked uh, floating around for a while. This was uh, new to this series, and it was it was sort of based on the idea that you know the kind of uh, earnings we were on at the time when you borrowed a mate's car, and it would be like seventeen years old and abandoned by a Turkish taxi driver, and they'd say, <laughs> you know, uh, when you when you steer to the right, you have to steer more to the right because the back wheel comes out because the handbrakes never truly off, and you, <laughs> and you think. Get this bloody thing to a garage, mate. It's a death trap. And I just thought it would be interesting um, to do that with somebody's body because you accept all these little quirks, you know, these aches and pains, the way you lean to one side, because, uh, and you don't sort of notice them after a while. But if somebody else came into your body, they would. And that was where this really came from. Um, on these sequences here with Chris looking at the, the screen, we experimented with... I don't know if I've done it on that shot. We experimented when he's looking head onto the screen of actually reflecting what was on the screen onto his head, which I'd seen in a movie. And I thought, this will be easy. And it wasn't. 
<laughs> but it sort of worked. Um, but more difficult than I thought it would be. So the scutter's gone mad. We get a nice scuttered mad shot yeah, at the beginning of it. To get back at the scutters, he was going mad all the bloody time. Yeah, he was just behaving normally. <laughs> It's, it looks like Rimmer knows what he's doing a bit, and it's quite. Yes, yeah, suddenly he's very competent. They're actually saving the ship from a major crisis. Mm. And uh, Danny Stevenson is saying that would be an interesting way to diagnose a condition. It really, wouldn't it? The doctor in. And now you've got me thinking of a different story, Danny. But I thought of it first. <laughs> <laughs> so you can up. Um, yes, so Craig is just set off the auto destruct button trying to get food. It wasn't it. This was just standard BBC graphics, wasn't it? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, oh, played I, it. I think it was... we played in there live. On we played into the studio. We won't put on afterwards. Well, where is this was shooting? Because it looks like you decided to keep Danny in some kind of cellar for the most of the episode. <laughs> uh, um, not intentional, I can assure you. <laughs> um, who was the voice of the vending machine? Was it Tony? I thought it was Tony. Then. Could well have been. I don't think it was in this one, was it? Mike Agnew? It could have been Mike. Jimmy Nile, obviously. Joe gets it right every time. Yeah. Yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy used to hang around the studios a lot and just come in and do a little voiceover now and then. <laughs> he, he, wasn't, he wasn't busy at the time. We <laughs> hey, self destruct. <laughs> they, uh, somebody was asking us earlier to do the, the zoom in each other's characters, but I should point out we have nothing like the skills to. Uh, <laughs> to ah! <laughs> no, I'd have to take it away and uh, and post we might up. Try that as a, a closing party episode or something. Yeah, an end of scene. <laughs> <laughs> um. So uh, yeah, I'm trying the mind swap. This is where it all comes up. Interesting dissolve. Another highly sophisticated electronic piece of equipment wrapped around. Craig's head. I have trust me, in those days, guys, that was top end <laughs> science fiction engineering, that was. <laughs> Lucy, at the time, Jimmy and I was a very big TV star. He starred in a, a huge ITV hit comedy called I'll Be the Zen Pet, which is what made his name. Hmm. And at this time, he would have been a very, very big. Uh, yes, he even got a hit single with Crocodile Shoes, which was awful. That's right. Hmm. That's right. He was, uh, he, was, he was in everything. I thought it was all right, Crocodile Shoes. Nice little track. Of course you did. <laughs> you also think you're handsome. Oh. Happy the same pet is a good old box set to go and get out if you, um, uh, you don't know it. Up. By Clement Lafrené, the uh, original, or one of the original writing covers. Did you respect them, Rob? I mean, they're porridge, of course. So. Oh, Clement Lafrené, heroes. 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 Uh, Happy the same pet. Which was produced by Alan McEwan who was Tracy Ullman's husband and yeah. uh, employed Ed and myself to do Girls on Top. So there you go, it all goes round. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. And Ruby wrote to him after the first episode and said, get this man Ed by out of here. <laughs> foisted him upon us so that he can go off and do other jobs and he is not competent. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The, the short red-headed one did try to get me fired off Girls on Top. The one tried to get him fired. In oh. fact, ladies and gentlemen, what happened was I then consulted my producer, Paul Jackson, to go, what do I do with the situation with this slightly difficult artist? And he said, the thing is, you really need to endure yourself to her and, you know, get her on side. And of course, I bloody overdid it. I ended up the bloody series that we which is not what I meant. <laughs> Lucy was asking rather excitedly if it wasn't she married to you. I think she was hopeful there that... <laughs> yeah, yes. Was that Lucy? Uh, that is Craig's uh, orgasm. This Lucy. is not... Sorry, this is not a technical effect. Craig had the ability to be able to make one of his eyes go cross-eyed. Yes, that was remarkable. brilliant. That was... Uh, he is acting in the... Um, and also, but the technical effect with the syringe, Ed, is very good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. But that was clever. Look, oh, well done, Craig. Come face, Andy, please. I hope not. I really hope oh. for everybody's sake that's not true. That is, it is. I can, I can vouch for it. Enough. <laughs> What's the question? Ask me why. <laughs> Think of the children. <laughs> are the children watching? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Molly, I'm sorry. Are the, are the, I've, I've assumed that there aren't children involved at this stage. Daddy, what is uh, what are they talking about? 
Yeah, she hasn't really got the children. Yeah, trauma gone bad. Stop it. <laughs> hey, this is this is me. Oh, I'm way behind on chat line. It's got stuck. Okay, here it is. I'm glad you enjoyed the Beatles book. Um, ah, talking about plugging books, I'll be doing that later. Oh, were you? Mm. The woman who tried to get me fired from uh, uh, Girls on Top has got a book out. <laughs> okay, so they don't self-destruct and the milkshake comes out in the edited <laughs> Red Dwarf style graphic milkshake bottle. We get a graphic of a toffee crisp from the 23rd century, for God's sake. <laughs> That's Danny just did a little effect. He did this uh, on the thing, and we tried to sort of make it look like it was a wipe, and then it revealed it was his arms. <laughs> it just looked like his arms. But anyway, it was a good idea at the time. <laughs> Great earring. Great earring. I do like the earring, yeah. Toffee so Crispy. Somebody just saw it, presumably, and thought, ah, that'll do for cat. Uh, I look like Pepto Bismol. You're right. It's the same, the same type of bottle. <laughs> David Wallace, Seinfeld used to talk about specificity in comedy. That's absolutely right. I'm not, I wouldn't argue with him even if it wasn't because he's brilliant. But um, Yes, but it doesn't have to be an existing brand for you to be specific about it. It's the, it's the classic is Victoria Wood made hobnobs famous and funny. And, um, it's just something about hobnobs that she could right. say it. Yeah, it was funny. It was all the time, of course. It's... Specificity is absolutely, and Seinfeld is the master of that mm. recognisable detail. Yeah, the bunk scenes. This is the did, sort of disappeared. He did, this, didn't he did steal Robert Scarpool. Uh, sorry, I missed the name there. Uh, he did. Uh, sorry, he did steal Robert Scarpool, and un unhappily, I, I think, because uh, it wouldn't have cost him anything to have acknowledged that. Um, and it was an absolute straightforward lift, and, and he made a million out of it. So, is that uh, coffee with comic? In cars and comics in cars with coffee. coffee yeah. And it was it was Robert Scarpool. You're right, we did have hobnobs in bottom. Yeah, we had to dry them out on Wimbledon Common. Hobnobs yeah. are uh, definitely what? a comedy biscuit, there is no question. Yeah, yeah comedy absolutely. Comedy. I would say an alternative comedy biscuit. I, I would say on pick that, you had to dry them out on Wimbledon Common. Yeah, it, we shot it, shot bottom in the studio. We were pretending in Wimbledon studio. We built the entire set, was a bit of the common. And at one stage, the biscuits go into a lake. We had a lake, and so they have to be dried out. And it's a very funny, but probably untransmissible line that they talk about there, about the film Deep Throat. That's all I can mention. <laughs> Deep Throat and Hobnob sounds like a good guy creating yeah. the name somewhere. The, actually, I think I can say, because I've said it, the, the gag was, I think, um, uh, have you seen that film? Because they're hungry. He says, have you seen, have seen that film where they all eat each other? And he went, yeah, what's it called? Deep Throat. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, they all Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, children. Are <coughs> the children still here? <laughs> Anybody mad enough to see the children in the room? Now, this was hard because I didn't believe personally ever that Lister would let him have his body. But then I thought the best, the only way in really was laziness. Uh, mm. You know, someone who would get it fit so he didn't have to go through the pain. But. It's a stretch. And I also don't know why the uh, resurrected officer was brown. Uh, that doesn't ring any bells to me. Oh, why wasn't it one of the known names that we, yeah. suddenly it, out of nowhere, Carol Brown emerges? Who, who did the voice for Carol Brown? Uh, I think it was uh, Leah Williams, I think. No way. Really? And she doesn't get so. credit for it. So yeah, yeah, she came in and dubbed for it. So Diva. I might be wrong. Anyone? Yes. Yeah. No, I'm right. Yeah. Then he's saying Leah. But she doesn't get a credit yet, unless I've skipped the credits, did I? How did we? How did we get her? She's awesome. Well, she wasn't well, at the day. You know, sometimes Rob, a... we can pick the stars before they become one. Yeah, Occasionally, some of us do that. She did. She did bits for us, Rob, way before she became this massive uh, stage and screen. Yeah, in fact, she was in. She was in Girls on Top. Mm. There's yeah. a shock of the size of his penis. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said that word. No, not with the kids. <laughs> Look, who's, who's invited these kids? Since when did this become a universal certificate? Yeah. Just this week. We're going to drop it next week. It's fun to play with it this week. Yeah, what's wrong with that set? Who's Look at that set. It's a great. 
Is I'm that not... corridor still the same corridor, Ed, as right back to series one? No. We've yeah, we, it, it, structurally, it has a few That's changes. A copy of that original yeah. uh, corridor that we first see at the very beginning of the end. No, it's not that Leia Williams from Blue Peter, you silly sort of. No. I mean, at the moment, everybody, he's cut his dreadlocks off. <laughs> <laughs> This used to be an annual thing at the end of the uh, series party. Yeah. It'd be the traditional cutting off of the locks and, and hurling them into the crowd like a bridal bouquet. <laughs> I, I got a set once. I'm not sure I wanted to keep them. Well, I had a set on the back of... Um, oh, you did? Uh, yeah. That we sold at uh, DJ last time. They are real hair, I think, yeah. Yeah, they are, yeah. yeah. No, I think you had them wove in for the... Well, they brought from a... Yeah. Well, this was common, aren't they? When coming they're... up, that's where you get what I would call a stunt. Uh, but Craig is very happy to do all his own stunts. <laughs> and here we go. In three, two, one, there. <laughs> Straight into the mashed potato. And poor Grady. And the Grady. <laughs> But it's a very good, again, it's a lovely reading of human nature, isn't it? Yeah. You know, he, as you say, the stretchy reason is I'm too lazy to do exercise myself. Somebody else can do them for me. Yeah. And of course, the moment Rimmer's in that body, all he wants to do is eat and drink. And, and have sensual pleasures because he hasn't had any. <laughs> and, he's <laughs> yeah, and he's got a gun at the top of his bunk. He has a pair of dueling pistols. Oh, yeah, I forgot about them. <laughs> Yeah, that's weird, but they come in, don't they, in the, later on? Yeah, they're badly placed there. It should be slightly above his head. We'll let it go. See, see how Chris is hitting the vowels? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The correct yeah. vowel shapes. <laughs> buzz. Is, is, is got yeah. buzz. How does it? Bass. Yeah. Buzz. We do do the double K for the double T sometimes, like a keckle. We have a little keckle. A little keckle. So I was saying earlier I'll for those who weren't there. Stairs. What about that? I'll go to the bottom of our stairs. I'll go to the foot of our stairs. I'll go to the foot of our stairs. Isn't it? And you're always saying that, Rob. You're always saying I'll that. I'll go to the foot of our stairs, I said. I'll go to the bottom of our stairs. <laughs> Was the costume intentionally Captain Scarlet? A question I've often asked. I've never dared uh, actually ask. Uh, Howard for it. No, we never asked. I, I think it was um, just a coincidence. Now, now in, this scene here with the... Um, yeah, the jacuzzi. Jacuzzi. I think that was a cutaway from an exterior. We, we never had that in the studio. We, no, didn't we have... Uh, is it a different app where Crichton has a, a, a lighter in his thumb? Yeah, I think we did a quick cutaway there for this episode. I think... Uh, I think I think Crichton was in that scene. Danny with his hair down is unusual. Um, I love I love Danny's Danny's really coming into his own. Yes, yeah. The uh, character got electrocuted. <laughs> <laughs> I love this as well. Because there are rumours, of course, and this is kind of an oblique reference to it, that over the course of a, a season, William Shatner would be at the snacks table <laughs> and by the end of the season he'd, he'd have to be wearing a man girdle. <laughs> <laughs> well, American Studios uh, craft services, as they're called, are an unbelievable, an unbelievable thing. Richard Curtis yeah. said to me that when I, he, he'd done something in America and I said, what do you know what struck you? He said, I could have recorded a series for the cost they spent on the craft services table, which is the catering yeah. That he put out the back. <laughs> Fabulous! They've got everything. It's a cool um, now, why Galista would be wearing a female corset when they make male corsets is beyond me. But yeah. no, no, no. they've run out of male corsets. <laughs> the course the and there's only a female one left, and it's a better Very journey. <laughs> As Ronnie Corbett once said, "So you can get out of my shot, and I can do the line to camera." <laughs> <laughs> Did he say that? Said it to an extra who was asking the director. What, sorry, what's my motivation for being a part actor? And the director was saying, could you just go there and do the peanuts? It was in Prince of Denmark behind a bar. Uh, could you just go and, and he said, I don't think the peanuts need doing. The director said, well, no, but just go there and wash a glass. Of he said, no, I can't. Why have I got to go over there? And Corby said, so you get out of my close up and I can do the gag. <laughs> Johnny, who, by the way, was the loveliest man. I mean, oh, I'm frozen. You've frozen? I'm frozen. Well, I'm all right. 
your video. I'll tell you what's happening. There's a shot of Red Dwarf. And See, now we've got a, a very, very underlit shot of... Um, oh, my God. Rimmer slash Lister. And okay. a shot of Lister slash Rimmer scoffing behind a sheet. Let it go, Jason Murray says, if you're frozen. Let it go. Let it go. Are you done? Uh, I, no, I'm trying to... I can't even quit it. Here we go, force quit. There you go. It will eventually do that. But uh, c carry on talking, guys. Till I, till okay. I well, now it's a, um, another blank scene. Um, <coughs> he's discovered he's cut his locks off. I was just saying earlier, for those who joined up uh, after the beginning, uh, obviously all of the, these voices were transposed in a dub afterwards. But one of the things was that because Chris could get the vowel shape so well, it was actually easier for Craig to dub it uh, afterwards than it was for Chris, although Chris's accuracy was fantastic. It just shows you, though, what the skill that Chris has, because mm. it, all you normally do is hear it, whereas mm. in this situation, you're forced mm. to look at what his mouth's doing. Yeah. Yeah. You realise that, in fact, his mouth is copying the way that mm. another speaker would, would yeah. speak, which is extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. So now we're back to normal. Uh, one of the other things was because we didn't have an audience, if you kind of analyze this show shot by shot, it's a lot more um, precise because when you do have an audience, you're under a lot of time pressure and you kind of have to get things done immediately. We're shooting this in, as effectively two days of pre record. We could sort of just retake shots because we felt we could just improve them a little bit look wise rather than having to do them for performance because when you shoot in front of the audience you kind of want to get through it qu as quickly as you can otherwise the audience get fatigued and you lose them damien the, the, the thing about real products was always an issue in fact it's just mm. they got a bit more picky about it you were never supposed to show a commercial product i mean you, ed will remember all of us runners and kids whenever there's a piano on a, um, uh, in shot, you had to run around and, and tape over the Bosendorf or the Steinway. Uh, mm -hmm. like, like people would run out and buy a Steinway because they saw somebody playing it on television. But, um, and Kellogg's packets, you had to, you know, pet, felt tip out the thing. So it was always an issue. And I suspect it was just one of those, at this time, it was they were being, had a particular downer on it, I suspect. Uh -huh. I just very often used to not bother, but then occasionally you'd get a directive saying it must, we must not have commercial products. Uh, David Wallace is asking, is it hard leaving the right gaps for the laugh? Um, yes, it was. I mean, it, 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 occasionally you can isolate a camera and you can extend a gap if there's a laugh. And as, as in like last week with Polymorph, there was such a huge laugh that we, um, you know, had to ice, pull up one of the isolated cameras and extend the shot just to get through the, for the laugh. But you kind of anticipate them. And to be honest, I can't remember, but we might well have showed this to an audience. Well, we did show it to an audience to get the laughs. But whether I went into another edit after that to tighten up where we'd left the gaps too long, I don't think so. I think we sort of got it about right. Chris was always an absolute genius at that. I remember going on a, one of the early shoots and, and watching him, and I thought, his timing's all completely off. What's he doing? Why isn't he... Fun? But then you play it to the audience. He was perfect. I tell you, the masters of it were the two runnies. They, uh, because quite a lot of the two runs, apart from the film, of course, in the middle, but we used to pre-record quite a lot, and they were geniuses at knowing how long the laugh would be and making it look natural when they were doing it in the studio. It's a real gift that really good comedians have it's just anticipating where the laughs are going to be you're right and how long they're going to be and and kind of acting as if they're hearing the laugh i think that's the real skill you you react as an actor as if you're actually hearing the laugh uh, when it's not there which is a real skill well it's a it's a weird thing isn't it because they can't step out of character and pretend there really is an audience but they have to sort of yeah. acknowledge the laugh somehow it's very the good guys are, are really good at it it's a skill. Uh, I think it was Molly mentioning earlier, Aid in, in Young Ones playing the pregnant part. He was brilliant at that, but Aid can distend his stomach. Yeah. In a quite yeah. ordinary way. We didn't need any uh, uh, makeup or prosthetics for that. He did it himself with his own stomach. He did. I know. It's astonishing, wasn't it? And, and slightly unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's Lister drinking? 
Um, <laughs> I think he was drinking something, oh, that white liqueur, what's it called? Um, Avocado. Avocado, could it have been oh, Malibu? Might have been Malibu. Malibu. <laughs> well, Malibu's clear, you don't put coconut liquid in it. Lovely set this, folks, we found. This is the, uh, when we are pre-recording, this was a, I'm trying to remember where this was. I think it was a disused... Um, Fabulous deep oh. stairwell, isn't it, Ed? I mean, just goes. Yeah, right. it was. It was a wonderful place. We all had to wear hard hats, and I kept hitting my head all the time. But it was a great place. Sudbury. Well, Danny's on a roll at the moment. He thinks it was in Sudbury. God knows why or how he'd know that. <laughs> oh, Sunbury. Yeah, yeah, it could be. It could have been the temp, the pumping station at Sunbury. But we also went somewhere else, and but that's a good call. It could have been there. We um, did. We did film some bits there, didn't we? And it wasn't far from the studios, of course, but when we were there. Yeah, yeah it was very close to Shepparton, well, so it was, well, it's very possible. But uh, that, looks, that place looked a little bit too big for it. Well, I'll check it out. But you could well be right. <laughs> Box of donuts. You see in there with the drilling pistol, well planted. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, what was that reference to white midget? It was, they definitely say in the title. It. In the subtitles though, it says the midget. The midget, exactly. What was that? Just a mistake? I think we, I'd wanted to get rid of uh, Blue. Blue midget. And, uh, and you I thought you'd I, I don't have know. a plot to call it white midget and then it would go away. That was the original name of Starbug until we saw the bug. Mm. Blue no, midget, we, white midget. That. That's a nice chase here. This is where our, our attempt at, um, yeah, we did all right, with an uh, intergalactic kind of <laughs> car chase. <laughs> that's a nice bit where the star bug hits a rock. So that's a whole big chunk of a uh, shot on a model stage, Ed. So yeah, that, it is. This is quite model heavy, this particular yeah. episode. But it wasn't particularly he heavy in any other. Um... Oh, yeah, this is a good crash shot, I think, coming up with yeah, that. Yeah, good crash shot. Good work, Peter Rag and his team. Yeah. White midget comes from white giant, I suppose. Uh, the smegging smegsy, smegging oh, dying, smegging killed me. <laughs> Classic line. R.I.P. Starbuck, but they've got hundreds of them in the holder. They just bring the next one up. Yeah. <laughs> As we said before. <laughs> oh, the scutters fixed this one. Oh, no, wait a minute. They've gone mad. Any one of them. <laughs> Of a fleet of <laughs> a fleet of scutters. <laughs> we normally had two working scutters at any one time of the invisible army. Did you have worries, uh, Rob, about whether they could actually pull this one off? I mean, it... I say this was the episode I had least worries about. I was much more worried about, say, time slides, which seemed impossible to me, but we didn't mention that to <laughs> it. <laughs> So where are we at now? I've got him on the bunk with his. Uh... Well, the, uh, he, there was a there was a, a chase between Midget and uh, and Starbug, yeah, right. and um, we're now he's back and he's got he's got his locks on an elastic band <laughs> around a bandage. Does that make sense to you, Rob? Yes, I know I, I'm there. Come on, Andy. We've had the, the the ZX joke before. We have. That's a repeat, Andy. Mm. Yeah, no, no apologies. <laughs> no apologies for that one. Time slides is next week, Lucy. Yeah. Yeah, and the cat. Nice, nice tag. No, I honestly, I didn't think there was going to be any problem at all. Yeah, this is a nice tag. <laughs> I do feel a bit strange about Crichton's morality here. I'm yeah. pretty sure that as his character developed. He would never be chloroforming Lister. Well, not the second time as well. Then he does it again to the cat, which I think. Yeah. Is... yeah. Well, once he's done it, he's done it. Either he can or he can't, you know. And you can rely on Danny to go for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. AI element. He doesn't learn from his mistakes. Yeah. Okay, so a fun episode. Um, like I say, I think it's a bit flat because um, because it was played into the audience rather than live, and you certainly get a whoomph from the audience, don't you, Paul? Yeah. It's funny, and I'd forgotten that it was completely shown uh, as a finished piece, Ed. 
Uh, and I just watching it this morning, I just thought, this is just a tiny bit flat. I think mm. I thought to myself, coming off the run of three extraordinary episodes, maybe it's yeah. just, you know, it's, we're back to a, a more normal. I mean, but I think you're right. It hasn't got that. that yeah. Familiar... Their, their performances get lifted yeah. back. Yeah. And when, whenever young writers, uh, or, or it doesn't have to be young, but novice writers come to me um, and say, would you recommend doing it live or without an audience and i always say you've got to when you, especially when you're starting out you've got to do it in front of an audience you, you learn so much more quickly and when you put your stuff out there and it's not getting laughs that sticks with you you do not want that to happen again ever it's the worst yeah. thing um, I, mean, I, think, I think the other thing is that there's a there is an invisible relationship between the performers and the audience and you know one actor said said it really well he said okay so i get it now you have to acknowledge that they're there but ignore them at the same time i said yeah exactly yeah um, it's really, but, really. But it does improve it does completely affect uh, uh, a performer and you can tell like with this show you can tell that um when the audience is missing even, when they're, missing. even when they're this good at the timing yeah, exactly. And then we, you know, these are good experienced performers by now, but even these guys, it, it's that invisible bond that you can see on the screen uh, in the performances. It's weird. Oh, we lost Lucy for a minute. The Wi-Fi went. Oh, sorry, Lucy. I want to tell you what we said. <laughs> yeah. and, and you want me to do something about it, Lucy? At <laughs> <laughs> the point of telling us all, I'm not quite sure what the hell I'm supposed to comment on that, Lucy. Really sorry, love. Oh, we were plagued there. I, I completely lost that computer. It's packed now, but uh, just in time for the end. Uh, Alex, excuse me, there are children watching. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> yeah, got you. <ya. laughs> well, to understand that word, then they won't object, will they? Yeah, you can't say that word, mother. You can't say that word. <laughs> children watching. Right. Oh. Yes. So uh, next week, time slides, and we can promise you a very, very, very. Very special book. Very special booking. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you all think who it is, of course. Uh, Why does everybody think it's going to be Hitler? I don't... <laughs> A different episode. <laughs> Wrong episode. <laughs> well, you've, you've, you've tumbled us, guys. We have indeed got a recording of Adolf. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. A couple times he has words of wisdom to say, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, no, it's not Adolf, but it's uh, it's a good booking. Time slides was a real technical challenge. I, I mean, just in terms of how do we tell this oh, story? Come on, for God's sake! <laughs> and listen, the other two can go, and I'll carry on talking to you guys you like about how difficult and complicated it was to make. <laughs> when do we get to the easy one, Ed? <laughs> what easy one? These are written by bloody Rob Grant. Nothing's easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying anything, but somebody's guessed it. Somebody's guessed it. Somebody's guessed it. I'm not saying who. <laughs> somebody's guessed it dead right, have they? Yeah. Have they? Oh, okay. Right, there you go. Well, we made it too easy for you folks, but uh, turn yeah. up and see if you're right. Yeah. Okay, guys. See you yeah. next week. Take. Lucy, are you just checking, Lucy? Are you with us at the moment, Lucy? Is, are you there? I'd just like to know. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I've just got to do one shout out. I've got to do one shout out to, to Jane. Who have you got to shout out? Yes, shout out. Go oh, sorry, I've got to shout out to Jane, who's her birthday. Sorry, I didn't do that last week. And also, there's this new book called um, And Now for the Good News, The Future with Love by Ruby Wax. Please buy it. it we need the money. Thank you. If you hold it up, that's how you do a plug. You hold the book up. Oh, yeah. Uh, just imagine this is it. <laughs> Is it a pop-up? She used the right pop-ups. It was on here earlier. <laughs> giving it away to someone. Giving you a cut on the basis I'll, of... I'll hold it up next week, sorry. Right. <coughs> right. Anybody who's dropped out or frozen, do let us know, please. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, let's go. Thank you, guys. See you next week. Take care. See you next week. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.